I think this is important because with all the air, all the things that you've mentioned, whether it's theonomy or whether it's social gospel, they're kind of two sides of the same coin. <laughs> they're, right. they're pulling us away in different ways to solve societal ill. Um, I mean, I think of of I always I always find I find Lloyd Jones fascinating on this because he's so recent. He said the social gospel, which was going to be all the solution in Europe to all the abuse, it emptied the churches. And and the reason he said that was because there was no power anymore that actually delivered people from what was most important. I mean, there were a million social programs you could go to that were better. I'm not omnicompetent pastor on these issues, right? Some pastors try to be. I know my limits, and I know what I've been trained to do uh, to proclaim the gospel that sets people free from the wrath and judgment of God. That's the old children's catechism, right? I mean, if we lose that, but I think the pressure today is we live in a changing society. This is where I think it's all derailed so many people. Bob Godfrey did a series here on the end of Christendom. We had everything sort of set up that in law and in order and in culture, Christianity was favored, so it provided an environment for us to flourish, right? Um, and some people would say, well, what, you guys don't want that anymore? Well, I, 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 want, I want justice to be maintained. I, I want, as we talked about, general equity. Um, but I guess what I'm saying is, is in the situation that we're in now, because it's moved so anti-Christian, on everyone's mind is we've got to fix what's happening and I feel as pastor, I'm being pulled this way and that way all the time yeah. to, in one way or the other, from the theonomists on one end to say, what, you, you, you don't want godly government? On the other end, what, you don't care about the oppressed? Right. And, and so I stand back and what I do primarily feels marginalized today. Yeah, yeah. Well, to, to speak to that, a couple of points you raised, I think are really important. And not just for officers like us, pastors um, who are called to preach, uh, but also for our people in the pews and lay people who aren't officers in the church. So a couple points. When I finished the first draft of this after a sabbatical, it was 76,000 words. <laughs> half the How length, do you chop that down? Well, half the length it is today. <laughs> Because that particular sabbatical in which I did most of the work uh, on this and and then finished and um, and then everything blew up about four years ago, right? Mm -hmm. um, right. COVID's it, a big factor in all this. COVID, mm -hmm. you know, the George, George Floyd incident mm -hmm. uh, and, um, and, and people are crying out for answers on this. Mm -hmm. So then I go, okay, this is really scary. I hope this isn't too provocative for for your podcast, but but uh, you know they, they know they know me. Okay, so <laughs> Flannery O'Connor has a saying like, uh, writing a book is like giving birth to a, a baby sideways, and uh, <laughs> this is the hardest baby I ever delivered because it doubled in length. And I go, oh my goodness, I'm going to try and address, address the race issue. I'm, right. I'm going right. to go back to that scary point in history mm -hmm. when it's not always gloriously reflecting the best of, mm -hmm. of the human race in our own country in North America, you know, with the Civil War, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but Chris, it's um, to, to come back and, yeah, you mentioned the social gospel. So just so everybody's on board. That was a movement in the early 1900s to redress the, the uh, difficulties that arose in the wake of the Industrial Revolution. Mm -hmm. And so a group of Germans, especially Rauschenbusch and others, developed the social gospel where now the gospel became more horizontal to try and ameliorate these um, ravages that were coming on the heels of, of the Industrial Revolution. My thesis in the book is that did not go away. It was like a big river that went underground, and now it's coming back up. And so the clamoring for the corporate mission of the church to address issues of, you know, alleged social injustice or mm -hmm. all kinds of things that it seems to me God never prescribed for the church's mission in the Old or New Testament um, and New Testament, especially in our time, are now, you know, we're receiving pressure to do that. Mm -hmm. And 
I've had numerous pastors come to me and go, thank you, because I feel like I'm freed. We have to be liberated in some way from all of this, because I can't handle, I can barely maintain what the calling is at times. I need a lot of help from the Lord, but then to put the world on my shoulders in these ways, brother, I can't do it. You you have to become an expert in in this social issue or this social issue, and, and, um, and it's not that we want to inculcate in our people um, a disinterest in serious um, social problems. It's more a mechanism of what's the appropriate way to do that. Mm-hmm. So I want Amen. individuals right. who are called to be, you know, politicians to go in to do that, mm-hmm. you know, for our law enforcement to maintain good order for people who called to journalism maybe or something like that. To, and and to, on that point, to be yeah. fair, maybe we haven't done well to encourage our people to go out and do those kind of things. Maybe we need to think more of how to encourage them in that. Yeah, either as individuals. As individuals. In their individual right. calling or as collectives of Christians. Right. Just right. don't ask Escondido URC to change its mission. And Ding, and, ding. I mean, that's it. Yeah, that's right. And so God's delineated these clear um, job descriptions. Oh, I was going to get back to Acts. May I? You can do, this is your floor. (laughs) (laughs) This is your table. Yeah, I'll be told that when I go in the room. (laughs) Here to address the assembly in a little while. But anyway, um, so to clear, I had this thought um, um, while I was working on this project. And I had preached on Acts 17 a number of times. I had a whole semester-long class at the university where I went on Acropolis, Athens. Mm-hmm. And oh, it was so wonderful. And I had the first, I had an opportunity to go there right before the um, COVID. And God willing, I have an opportunity to go there again next January with my, with my bride. And, um, and that, that was amazing. So I'm, I'm referring to Paul speaking at the Areopagus, which is at the foot of the Acropolis, and a place where there was exchange of ideas and possibly a judicial court. We're not sure. But look, here, here real quick, um, I won't give you everything in the end, but I go, well, maybe this is an appropriate way to end, you know, the book. Because here's Paul, finds himself in Athens, which Western civilization is a footnote on Athens. Rome politicized everything Greek. They basically adopted it and then, you know, imperialized it for their own uses. But Athens is a symbol of the greatest ideas, the most memorable, iconic arts and architecture. It's, it's almost ineffable to try and describe how influential it was. Now, it would be like it would be like um, taking Harvard Square back in the day when, when Harvard was still, you know, the epitome of, of academic excellence, which I'm not sure is the case today. But anyway, <laughs> and, 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 and taking, you know, the Louvre and the British Museum with all that iconography or Washington, D.C. with all that statuary and everything else and, and combining those, you know, the best of intel, intellectual um, um, product that a human beings can produce. And, and all this art and architecture, you know, from a visual standpoint, um, and, and combining all that and plopping it right down in one place. And here's Paul. Um, you know, arguably in line to become one of the greatest rabbis in Jerusalem because he studied under Gamaliel. And, and, and tremendously well-educated in all things Greek and all things uh, mm-hmm. Hebrew. If he thought the primary mission of the church— <laughs> I was waiting for this punchline. <laughs> —was to try and transform— I know. Um, —you know, and, and, and change those philosophers, you know, the Epicureans, uh, you know, that were there— as Acts 17 record, you know, they're thinking or address that directly or whatever, then that's his moment. But what does he do? 
Act 17, yeah, the climax is the resurrection, but it's like a mini systematic theology. Mm -hmm. He touches on almost Condensed. every loci. Mm -hmm. You know, he touches on creation. He touches on what we would call the covenant of works because he talks about descendant from one person. He, he, he you know, he, he talks about the providence of God, you know. You live and, and work and move in, in you know, this, this atmosphere, and et cetera, et cetera. And then he crescendos with the resurrection, which all these, uh, you know, um, people sitting around just having their mind um, teased by the latest, greatest idea that was floating through Athens. And most of them are scandalized. But the point is, we know at the end of Acts 17, there's a couple of um, Christians there who believed, and their names are immortalized in Scripture because they, they heard Paul preach and they believed, and I think it proves the point. This mm -hmm. was Paul's—this was what made Paul's heart throb. This is so important. Right. So, this is so, so when people go, Here's your opportunity. So when people say, you know, well, you know, um, um, sh shouldn't we, you know, be uh, involved in addressing this social malaise in, in downtown Escondido or whatever? There's nothing wrong with a group right. of people from your church reaching out uh, to the poor and destitute or street people or whatever and that kind of thing. But Social gospel kinds of projects um, that get away from declaring uh, what our primary mission is, you know, the true Christian liberty, that we, we have a message uh, given in our 66 books of the Protestant canon uh, that promises liberty in, 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 in a greater way than anything you're hearing out there in the world, namely— you can be liberated from the tyranny of the devil and all his epigonies and and minions. You can you can find release from the yoke of bondage to sin, and um, isn't that enough for the corporate church? If that's what our true mission is, through word and sacrament, mm -hmm. and yes, yeah, through church discipline as well when necessary. Right. Those and, three marks, right? Which is always restorative for us again, right. not punitive. Right. Exactly. And and um, and. Okay, great. You know, we have to address this particular social ill or that particular social ill. And it's like, if, if that's a burden in your heart, then go do it. That's great. And find a worthy mechanism to um, carry that out. Uh, but don't expect the corporate mission of the church to address those things primarily. And don't tell Pastor Gordon that you need to become an expert on this and this and yeah, this. I, I mean, I don't want to be. I really don't. I, I it's was exhausting. trained. I can't do it. Yeah, I don't right. have the bandwidth. Yeah. You know, I had the privilege of to preach a message at the synod to open it up. And I thought the end of Hebrews 10, he's appealing to the coming of Christ yeah. and his punishment of the world for their sins. I just feel that in the midst of all this, we have all these people, this becomes the dominant discourse in, among Christians. We lose the primary thing. And you know, I, I go back to this all the time. I probably overquote it all the time, Brian, but in John, I think it's John 6, Calvin's com John 20, Calvin's commentary, he says, many things are undoubtedly contained in the gospel, but the primary aim by which God wants, what's God wants to accomplish through the gospel is the forgiveness of sins. And um, when you said Paul, the Areopagus, his heart to accomplish that, to preach the gospel so as to set people free. Same thing is true going through Acts with before him, before Bernice and Agrippa. That was a political mess. <laughs> uh, she was like, I think 12, there had been a divorce, the whole thing. And his, he even says it to them. I want you to believe to receive the forgiveness of your sins. He wants to go to Nero for what reason? You know, if we lose this, right. I don't know. I don't know what we have as any power to deliver people from what is most important. Right. We don't have any other power. Right. Chosen appointed power, which is the point of your book. Well, and so recently I was preaching on Daniel 7 and and I was rereading some of Voss's sermons and and um he has a great um sermon 
uh, essay on being heavenly minded. Yeah, I've read cool. that. And grace is that in Grace and Glory? Grace and Glory. Yeah, it's such a. And good. so, of course, we're all familiar with D.L. Moody saying, uh, you know, don't be so heavenly minded. You're no earthly yeah. good. I think we need more heavenly minded. <laughs> well, you know, that's and and that's what Daniel does in Daniel seven, right? And I'm going, yeah. you know, this speaks to our relationship in this political season as far as church state relations. And it's like, look what Dan, look what Daniel does. He testifies. Mm-hmm. To what has been revealed to him, and and Voss has this great line where he says basically, when you turn completely horizontal, you know, just to, to only be concerned about, and I think because he's coincidental, in other words, at the same time with Rosh and Bush and all these social gospel guys. So if you read in biblical theology or Grace and Glory, you read him against the backdrop of that makes total sense, even though he doesn't name them. He says, if we become so horizontally focused that we're not heavenly minded, then we're no better than Esau uh, selling our our, uh, heavenly, you know, birthright. We need to quote that angle. Yeah, that's right. So that when -hmm. you come to church on the Lord's Day uh, or any other officially uh, uh, called, uh, see, I'm being deferential to my Dutch Reformed brothers here, or any other officially called, uh, you know, uh, worship service to the church, that's respite for the people. It's a respite. Amen. Here's a place Amen you can that. come. You don't have to wake up and hear what's going on in Gaza and Israel right now and what's going on in Ukraine and Russia and what's going on with all the sexual abuse and trafficking, you know, that's on the news. We're all being pummeled by. Those things are really, really important. And we even... At Escondido OPC, we pray about those things. Mm-hmm. I pray about the wars even that, oh, Lord, please bring an end to this yeah. um, so that all these souls that are dying, both combatants and otherwise, don't have to go out into eternity mm-hmm. unprepared, right? And, and so it's Amen. not that we're unconcerned about those things, uh, but if we turn our focus away from that, we sell our heavenly birthright. That's exactly right. One of the things I think that's important, I think I heard it from a delegate in his devotional this morning. I thought it was good. Uh, he said when he um, preaches, his son came up to him one time and said, Dad, why do you look so angry? Um, I, I thought that was really helpful. Um, sometimes it's good to listen to your sermons to see. I do that sometimes and realize uh, it sounded too aggressive. <laughs> I just get excited. But um, I think it's important because whether it's the sort of, on the other angle, all the movements seem to me, I don't want to be a broad sweep here because I don't think that's all fair, but most of the movements that we deal with that are seeking to pull us away from good news, the disposition is a lot of anger and frustration no, that's right. into these movements that I take theonomy, I even take Christian nationalism. The movement itself, um, they and because there's an inability to forget the context, they don't understand the context we're in applying Old Testament ethics to to this sort of common grace, new covenant era, they'll take something like Psalm 139. I think this was a controversy in the OPC in a sermon. 139, do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? I hate them with a perfect hatred. And you almost get a sense that that very disposition attitude should transfer into our ministry today to crush the enemies of the Lord. And we see clearly in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus saying, that's what the Pharisees taught you. They misunderstood that passage. That's eschatological. That's judicial. We understand that that will happen at the at the second coming. But then he turns it on their heads and he says, "I tell you, love your enemies. Right? Bless those who curse you. And if one punches you in the face, turn the other. Slaps you, turn. That's an ethic. Right. That is difficult for us right now. Right. But it's our calling because we are, even in the Beatitudes are difficult for us right, right. now. Right. But it's exhibiting, why are we behaving like that? Because I think, you can comment on this, when he gives the Beatitudes, he then explains who we are and our identity in the world is salt and light. That it's the certain character of the Christian in a Christ-likeness that actually affects the culture. So when the church is doing its primary job, setting people free with the forgiveness of sins, they will then go out into the culture and be salt and light and accomplish the very thing that these people are looking for in, in a more effective manner. No, I think, I think you're absolutely right. You raised really interesting points there that trickle down <laughs> to all of us who, who have our feet on the ground, whether officers in the church yeah. 
or Christians trying to, you know, live out our pilgrimage in this in this very difficult world. Right. And, um, you know, this has come up a couple of times, but what Alan's trying to do in his book and what I'm trying to do and Daryl Hart and John Meather have been trying to do with repristinating this doctrine of the spirituality of the church, which I call the primary mission of the church, is, is um, not necessarily targeting uh, the progressives on the left. Yeah. So let's just take an example, the extreme example of liberation theologians. Um, and, um, um, but they don't like what we have to say. Mm-hmm. But to your point earlier, but neither do those, if I could say it this way, on the extreme right, per mm-hmm. se. Right. Whether they be theonomists or Christian nationalists or whatever. Uh, that we all need to be self-reflective and say, with regards to the corporate church, are we maintaining um, the primary mission of the church and sticking to our job description, or are we stepping out of bounds and maybe get caving into pressures to address things that we're really not called uh, uh, to address? And sometimes those might be out of frustration or, or anger, unfortunately. And um, so I was at when this when the book first came out and I was asked, I was traveling back east, I travel back east a lot, um, to do a Sunday school to class. They said, you know, will you talk about your book? And so um, I, I said, sure. And um, and they just wanted me to do my gig. And uh, <laughs> so I did. And um, things kind of blew up after I left. And because I had some... Um, um, culture warriors and theonomists in the congregation that the pastor had painstakingly been trying to bring along and teach and instruct. And so I get a call Monday night after I get home. It's like, oh, yeah, there's a special session meeting called tonight, special consistory meeting. It's like, um, you know, um, the this stuff that you're promoting is destroying the church. And it's like, well, no, um, you know, you're the one that's being divisive in the church with regards to, you know, expecting the church not to be following its primary mission. And um, anyway, um, that got worked out over time. And, but, but um, I think, I think you're right that this doctrine is a good reminder that we don't need to be cynical. Mm-hmm. We don't need to be angry. Right. Um, we're citizens of heaven and the world to come, and we would we should expect persecution. We should expect resistance. The more we try and commit ourselves to godly lives and godly living, um, and then to be reminded, like Daniel reminds us um, throughout all the first seven chapters of Daniel, that um, that's the way it's going to be. But God is sovereign. Mm-hmm. And he's in control, and he is moving us to a better country yeah. um, and a better homeland when we won't have to experience and feel these tensions anymore. Yeah. Um, like at Hebrews 10, I just can't get it out of my head. <laughs> I can't get the comment out of my head because this is what I just preached. They, you joyfully, at one time, you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property because right. you knew you had a better inheritance. That's a tough sell for American Christians. <laughs> I mean, I would struggle with that. I I would. Um, but I think the point you're making is absolutely right. Um, the heavenly mindedness point. We have a city prepared for us. Yeah. So when I'm preaching on Revelation or Daniel, for example, I use this illustration a lot. I just go, did you hear? God just gave you a spoiler alert. So, you know, it's really bad form when we send our kids off to the movies to go see the latest, you know, Star Wars or whatever, because love always trickles down. The kids get to go first, right? (laughs) And then they come back and they tell you who dies, you know, in the movie. And it's like, that's a, that's a, that's bad form. That's a spoiler alert. You know, just can't do that. No, but God gives us spoiler alerts all the time. All the time. And, and ones that sharply challenge us. So, like, on, on the no, notice on the notion of the primary mission of the church, if that if Stuart Robertson is right, that that ultimately goes back to the eternal council, yeah. and 
And then you look at the ends and the book ends, you know, this inclusio. It's like God has not only told, told us from eternity past that he's sending the Son into the world to do his work so he might, you know, earn um, his reward, namely the elect uh, church of God. And then he tells you at the end, uh, you know, with the new Jerusalem, um, that that's what we're going to have. Um, but you're right. I mean, uh, real quick, uh, Daniel, Daniel 7, it's fresh in my mind, so I was preaching it last week, and I had chosen out of our Psalter hymnal 149. And 149 is interesting because it's a battle scene. And so we talked a lot about this on our Psalter hymnal committee. And it's like, because we have some people that think that there's certain imprecatory psalms we shouldn't sing. We were were of the opinion we should sing them, but we should educate our congregations to know how to sing them. Because we're not singing like the Old Testament saints. We're singing more like the Lord's Prayer, thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. But you know, here I have the here I have the congregation scene one forty nine. I go, this is a battle. Did you notice? Luther called the Psalter a little Bible. So if the Psalter mimics the entire Bible, this is the final battle. This is Revelation nineteen twenty when Jesus comes back on his white horse. Ultimately, I mean, you a lot of steps to get there, but it's yeah. ultimately that's what it is. Because there's all kinds of imprecations in there about the saints taking up the sword, and I go. But that's not what you're supposed to do. I mean, I'm embarrassed to admit that I, you know, have fellow ministers in my own denomination who think that we should still be applying penal sanctions to homosexuals, you know, similar to the Old Testament. And they'll say that publicly. Mm -hmm. And that's embarrassing to me. Mm -hmm. And I'm sad to even say that. And, um, um, but that's not how we should respond, like you said, in this day and age. This is an ethic that we pray and sing as a as a, a new covenant people in anticipation that Christ's kingdom will eventually come, and all rights will uh, all wrongs will be made right. Amen. And right. and and you know we need to develop that heavenly mindedness among our people, and I think under the rubric of the spirituality of the church and the right administration of the sacraments, right preaching of God's word. And to that point, it doesn't mean we don't address social issues right. when it's appropriate from it's God's appropriate. word. Right. And, and I'm glad you said that. I think that should be accented that I, you're not saying that no. et- not can ever be done. Right. Well, yeah. So if, if, if I'm preaching on Psalm 139, I think it's entirely appropriate that I make a comment on the unborn. Right. I do too. He's talking about the preciousness of, yeah, the womb. Right. But if you start overlaying a template on Scripture so that right. all our sermons are horizontal yeah. and uh, uh, addressing whatever the latest social issue is de jour, um, yeah. that's, that's not right. And, I'm, and ultimately, it's not right because, you know, we see this at the seminary all the time when people come in and they haven't been used to this. Yeah. You cannot bind somebody's conscience from the pulpit. You know, it's all tied up with the RPW too, right? Mm -hmm. It's like the beginning of the Reformation, as Daryl Hart uh, so beautifully catalogs, was eating sausage. (laughs) (laughs) You know, so yeah, you know, Zwingli goes, Lent, you're telling us we can't eat meat? No, we're going to have a sausage party. (laughs) And so, like, I have no right to bind my people's conscience. I can't. Mm -hmm get up and pound the pulpit and tell them how they would vote um, yeah. uh, on any issue. Yeah. This is really helpful. Is that, is that, yeah, no, I, I, I'm really thankful for your, for your book. I, and, I, and you, I, I mean, can you, highly you, commend cause I'm reviewing it right now. Um, Brother Strange's book. What was the title you quoted? Uh, Empowered Witness. Empowered Witness. It's really good. It's, it's mostly limited to discussions about Hodge, but he is trying to have something very accessible to apply uh, to the present questions, which are so pressing and timely. And so it's a, it would be a great accessible uh, volume. And he's committed, like I am, that those of us who are trying to talk about this in our reform circles, um, that we, you know, even though we may have our differences among us about how this plays out, or even on subtle nuances, um, we are convinced that this is so important a doctrine 
and so timely right now to get before our churches and pastors that, you know, we're not going to emphasize those uh, minor points and neglect to the major points that are there in our history mm -hmm. all over, but they've been yeah. forgotten and we need to re them. Yeah, we have to go right back to Romans 1, 16, 17. Why did he want to go to Rome? Preach the gospel to him. Yeah. It's the power of God for salvation, all who believe. Yeah, whether you believe this goes all the way back to eternity past or not, it's not. There's a lot of misinformation out there about the primary mission of church, spirituality of the church, that says it's an American thing that was dreamed up during the Civil War. That's not the case. Mm -hmm. That's wrong history. Most immediately goes back to Scotland, the disruption controversy, uh, where you know the state was trying to assign ministers to certain posts and oversee mm -hmm. sacraments, oversee discipline. Right. And our Scottish and Irish brothers said no. Um, and so, but it goes all the way back to the early church and then even behind it, that yeah. I think. Yeah, absolutely. Is that helpful? Very helpful. I'm grateful that I was able to pull you out of a synodical meeting. We got it done. <laughs> and we went through this um, without your book in hand, too, which was, yeah. it's, it's really impressive. Oh. You know, you have that all right here. Well, yeah, like I told you, you know, I carried that baby in my womb for a long time before I delivered it. It was a painful Books delivery. are like that. Books are like that. <laughs> so anyway, thanks for the opportunity. Okay. It's a privilege to be with you and always, always yeah. uh, enjoyed it. And uh, hey, on a personal, because I know you took a lot of hits on this issue too. And yeah. I'm just so thankful for your faithfulness to the things that we've just talked about and this church's faithfulness. I mean, I was worshiping being here for a year and a half. 20 years ago when I first got here and, and uh, have ongoingly, you know, been uh, in contact with you all and raising our kids together with your congregations, um, parents. And, um, but I'm especially appreciative of, of your faithfulness, brother. Thank, thank you, brother. And, um, your con and your commitment to these convictions. Thank you. I yeah. appreciate that. And uh, if I could, if I could sheep still, I'd steal you, you know, you could come back. <laughs> Zach, just, Zach, Zach wouldn't be very happy. You're just like your Hilder <laughs> down at Santee when I filled in down there for a while. You can cut this part out editing later on. But, you know, when they were waiting for William to camp come and I was yeah. down there and it's like, you know, Dave, bless his heart, and John, who's here, it's like, you know, William's going to need some help when he gets here. It's like, <laughs> is Zach heard you saying this? Like, yeah, you, we, have to, uh, we have to give each other a hard time. But, hey, thank you for coming on today. Yeah, I really appreciate it. It's my pleasure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We'll get you back soon. Okay. Thank right. you. Yep. Thank you.